Michael Francis is a lot of things. He's a motivational speaker, he's a religious zealot, and he's a mafia rat. Don't let his stories fool you, because many of his stories are in fact lies, inflated to the point of incredulous hilarity. If you don't believe anything that I'm about to tell you, I offer you this. Go and watch all of his videos, and you'll see what we have all seen. He changes his stories and has a dozen times. What is true is that at one time, he was a captain within the Colombo crime family before becoming an FBI informant and cooperator. So, I invented the tax scam. You all have to look very hard to see the two dozen different variations of this story that he tells. But what is the truth? Some background is actually required, and you know how we do it here on Mob Talk Radio. This guy... Marat Balagula, he was a Soviet Jew, arrived in Brighton Beach, which was a Russian enclave in Brooklyn in 1977, with a little with a little work, and the average pay per hour being less than four dollars an hour. Balagula had to supply food, fa- food and shelter for his family. Balagula would open up a restaurant in Brighton Beach, and then he would use those fund, funds from that to open up a nightclub and other businesses on Brighton Beach Avenue. He also dealt heavily into narcotics, which would event, which would lead him to eventually meet and become related to a guy by the name of F.C. Agron, who at that time had arrived in America in 1975 and had become the Russian Jewish mob boss in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. It's with Agron and Balagula that they came up with several schemes to defraud the IRS, and in that form came the gas tax scheme. The scheme, in one part, was designed to sell tax-free home heating oil as diesel fuel, and that would eventually cost the state of New Jersey $1 billion in losses every year in tax revenues. Balagula further pushed deep into the fraud by forming hundreds of burn companies to confuse the IRS, which enabled them to avoid state and federal gas taxes. Both Balagula and Agron were selling $150 million of fuel a month while pocketing anywhere between $30 to $50 million in unpaid tax. When the IRS tried to investigate, they would find addresses attached to these companies were often at phone booths, abandoned buildings, abandoned homes, and in the middle of nowhere. On May 4th of 1985, Agron gets clipped, and Balagula takes over as the new Russian mob boss in Brooklyn. Michael Francis had heard about the gas tax scheme through gossip. At the time, Michael was an alleged captain within the Colombo crime family. He felt the gas scheme should belong to him, so he sent Frankie Schiartino to visit Balagula's men to attempt to extort money from him. He was also threatening to take over the gas tax scam. What Francis didn't know was Balagula was close with dozens of members of organized crime. He requested a sit-down through the Lucchese crime family over the issue. Balagula was told to go to the 19th Hole Social Club to meet with Christy Tick Funari. In attendance was Anthony Gaspipe Casso, Marat Balagula, and Christy Tick Funari. Michael Francis was ordered to attend that meeting but didn't bother to show up. The situation was explained and Funari agreed that there was enough money to go around for everybody so they would split up the percentage of money in return the Lucchese crime family would protect Balagula. Balagula was told that if anyone encroached on his turf or gave him a problem, he he was to directly contact Anthony Gaspipe Casso. And what they came up with was a 2% per gallon tax for each of the five families. Not long after it was said that Francis was petrified and terrified of Balagula, and he kept away from him because of Christy Tick Funari. So the truth is, he didn't invent shit. He didn't bring in the family $8 million a month. None of that is true. In fact, it had zero to do with Michael Francis. Christy Tick Funari is the one who made the arrangement, and I guess Francis cannot do simple math because 2% of $40 million is only $800,000. So either he can't fucking do simple math, or as we said at the beginning, he's just a fucking liar. He didn't invent the scam. Agron and Balagula did. He didn't bring in $8 million a month from the gas scam at all. He was irrelevant to the entire deal. In fact, later on down the line, 
His own father gave the Columbos permission to kill him because he was skinning money from all of his side projects and not kicking up. Those are facts. Michael Francis throughout the years has always claimed that he was a mafia boss. Apparently, he doesn't understand the hierarchical structure of organized crime. And apparently, none of these people who interview him understand organized crime from a hierarchical structure either. Because Forbes, I believe, in 2008, wrote a list of the 20 most powerful gangster bosses, mob bosses to ever have lived, and he was number 18. I would love to understand their logic behind that. Because number one, Michael Francis was not a boss. He pretends to be a boss, but he really wasn't a a boss. Okay, those are just facts, but Michael distorts that reality because of his ego. Okay, now, if you want to break down what a boss is, we all know what a boss is. A captain is a captain, a boss. Sure, a captain is a boss, and a captain has a crew underneath of him. Here is what I would like all of you to do. Research this all day long. Tell me five guys that were underneath him and his crew. Where did he have his crew headquarters? You can't tell me because there is nothing out there. There's nothing. Even old timers I talk to say, nah, he was nothing. He was nothing. He was the biggest pussy, the biggest wimp who lived off his father's name his whole entire life. Those are facts. Those are just facts. The fact is, you look at any hierarchical organizational structure chart the FBI put together, they never put him in as a captain. You go to all of the databases and all of the different fucking websites you can. You will never, never, ever, ever see Michael Francis labeled as a captain. If so, I want somebody to tell me the five to ten guys he had underneath of him. Please tell me that. Please tell me that. Because I firmly believe that Michael Francis was never a captain. I happen to believe that Francis was a high-earning soldier. Did he make a lot of money? Absolutely. Nobody is refuting that. However, there's not one instance, not one street guy who has ever come out and validated that claim. Nobody has ever validated that claim. He was never, ever, ever a boss. And I speculate whether he was even a captain. I speculate that. Because a lot of the things we're going to talk about in part three are random oddities. So when Francis goes on these shows and he talks about his life and how dangerous he was, he he never smacked the fly in his life. He wasn't a tough guy. He was an earner, but he was an earner through schemes and scams, not a guy who was intelligent enough to go out and do his own thing. He brags about the gas, gas tax scam nonstop. He's done it for the last four years, but they're all lies. I don't like Sammy Gravano, but Sammy Gravano put him in his fucking place immediately. That's the reality. Go to any website, go to any book. Please tell me who was in his crew. Who did he supervise? Give me five guys he supervised. Please. I want you to do that. Name me five guys he supervised. You can't do it, and neither can Francis, because he's a liar. You know... Francis has incorrectly claimed that he was never an informant because, in fact, he actually was. Not only did he dime out the boxing commission to the U.S. Senate, but he also put two other men in prison and others were probably not even aware about. One was a janitor who worked at his father's office and the other, Norby Walters. This is a guy he said was like his uncle. So who was Norby Walters? Well, Norby Walters uh, came up in Brownsville section of Brooklyn. His father was a Polish immigrant. 
Uh, he served and boxed in the Army through World War One, and then opened a bar and a nightclub in the neighborhood. When Norby Walters and his brother uh, Walter took it over, they rechristened the place Norby and Walters Bel Air. As Mr. Walters would go on to tell the story some years later, the sign lacked an ampersand, and Norby Walters was born. That's where he got his name from. In the 1950s and the 1960s, Norby Walters opened up a series of mambo joints and pizzerias and, and a Chinese restaurant named the House of Wong in Howard Beach, Queens. He soon took over a small struggling nightclub in the shadows of Manhattan's Copacabana on the East 60th Street, calling it Norby Walters Supper Club. The club was forced to shut down after two mobsters began harassing an African-American patron who, who returned and shot both mobsters dead. Uh, not long after that, Norby Walters would leave the saloon business, the bar business, and he went into the music business as a booking agent. At first, he built his roster with regional regional lounge acts until a singer from New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, a woman by the name of Gloria Gaynor, reached the stratosphere with I Will Survive, and it scored her first hit record with Never Can Say Goodbye. Norby Walters was more of a jazz and standards guy than a disco guy, but he followed the money nonetheless. He became a chart chaser, which basically was a hustling disco era track date. He would just go after people he knew could make him a ton of money. He had two young partners, Jerry uh, Ad and Sal Michaels, and they would form what was called the Norby Walters Association. Later, it would be called the General Talent International. It was, me it was a mentoring situation in the early days, and then it was more uh, about Norby Walters' mentoring them uh and so hip-hop believe it or not hip-hop pioneers eric b and rakim would actually name check norby walters in a couple of their lyrics so if you've never heard that go ahead and look for it but the agency that he owned i uh, had tina marie frankie beverly the barquets the peaches peaches and herb uh, the commodores the four tops luther vandross patty labelle george clinton rick james cool and a gang and the gap band he was known as the funk guy general talent would represent 80 percent of the r&b and funk charts if they wanted to make it big and they wanted to get on the right tours and grow their business uh then they had to be with norby walter's company uh and so as his partners wanted to expand the business into more white mainstream charts uh walters had his sights set on a different kind of uh format he wanted to get into athletes uh, with trademark flamboyance, Norby Walters and a young partner named Lloyd Bloom barnstormed the world of big time college sports, flashing cash at dozens of star football players under their world sports and entertainment banner. Uh, they would sign and post date contracts to circumvent National Collegiate, Collegiate Athletic Association regulations. In other words, they could circumvent and give them money. Okay, just the short end of it. Uh, many of the players. Uh, would eventually leave Norby Walters' company uh, when it was time to go professional, but he took care of them in the amateur ranks. Um, but Norby Walters would end up suing six of his former clients for breach of contract. Uh, when players reported being threatened over their betrayals and an associate of a rival agent was found beaten in her Chicago office, the FBI initiated a criminal investigation that came to paint Mr. Walters and Mr. Bloom as mob connective uh mob connected people uh in 1988 both were charged with racketeering and fraud unrelated to the beating of the agent norby walters denied being in business with the mafia if anything he saw himself as the victim of his own success um let's see what else uh mr walters uh you know was convicted in that was sentenced to prison but that would later be overturned on appeal uh and uh, both Walters and Bloom entered conditional guilty pleas of mail fraud, which was also later overturned. And Norby Walters would end up shelling his share of the booking agency to a former partner, Mr. Aid. Uh, and he went to L.A. and just retired. Uh, as it happened, his former partner, Bloom, was already in Los Angeles trying his hand at the movie industry and in deal making. In the summer of 1993, he was shot to death in his rented Malibu home. Uh, and Norby Walters would end up going on in 1982 through the next 25, 30 years, would do the Night of 100 Stars, which would air on uh, 
ABC. So Norby was able to make a life for himself after all of that. But Michael Francis had nothing to do with Norby Walter's business. Michael Francis wanted a sentence reduction. Now, Michael has claimed over the years that he was involved in negotiations. He was the one that was making threats. I don't believe that, and I don't buy that, and I never have. This is, once again, because there was nothing in the case file to corroborate anything that Michael Francis was saying, and this is one of the reasons why that case was overturned. It was overturned because of prosecutorial misconduct and the fact that Francis lied. Those are facts. But, like I said, I firmly believe that Francis just ratted him out so he could get a sentence reduction. So Norby would go away because of the information and the testimony that Michael Francis would give. Uh, he put people in prison. But as I said, uh, he has fully denied this over the years, but he made a mistake years ago by sitting down with Vanity Fair and doing an article. Not only did he admit to becoming a cooperator, but he verified that he signed a one-year cooperation deal with the FBI prior to testifying against Norby Walters, which was considered a Chicago organized crime case. The article even interviews his mother, Tina, where she literally says, I don't respect Michael for what he's done. Uh, when you went to school and someone threw a paper and the teacher rest, who threw it? How many raised their hands and said, he did it? That's not the way we were brought up. Why do that to people that didn't hurt you? I can love him till I die, but I can never forgive him because it's too huge. I'm hurting every day. He could have hung in on j- he could have hung in in jail another two years, and then he could have chosen to do whatever he wanted to do. But he chose to be a rat. He chose to go on the witness stand. Keep in mind, this is the same woman who years later desperately needed money to keep her home, and she begged Michael Francis for money to help her out, and he refused to give her a dime. He refused. But it goes deeper. Not only did Francis give information and names up when it came to boxing and the mafia's hands in that uh, sport, but he also told the FBI names, ranks, and positions of other members in the mafia, including his own father. He also continues to lie and say he never had a deal with the government, but he did. Because of this information and testimony, his 12-year sentence was reduced from 12 years to four years. He still owes the United States government millions and millions upon millions of dollars in restitution, which he's never paid. But, you know, the God thing, that's tax exempt. He also tells two big whoppers in the form of John Gotti. Number one, he brags he beat John Gotti out of a business beef. There is no factual basis for that, and it's a lie perpetuated by Francis to be relevant. He has to stay current. From what I was told today by multiple people, Gotti only met Francis once and he scared the everlasting shit out of Michael Francis. And the way the story goes is that after Michael allegedly became an acting captain for his father, you notice not an acting captain in the crime family for his father, for his father, uh, Francis found himself at odds with a man uh, who held a title within the Gambino crime family. And that would have been rising star named John Gotti, who was a captain at the time. According to Francis, an associate was running a Long Island flea market and he asked Francis to chase off a partner who was dealing drugs on the side. Francis, who had an interest in the operation, did so only to be told that the drug dealer had ties to John Gotti. He reportedly said, fuck John Gotti. Now, Go back to this lie-filled story, and you can go back and see this in video. He tells this story nine or ten different ways every time, and he always says he beat John Gotti out of the flea market, but in reality, that's not what really happened. As Gotti heard about Francis running his mouth, he demanded that Francis come to the Our Friend Social Club in Queens, and per multiple sources, Gotti told him, you know, if there's a guy running around saying, fuck John Gotti, what do we do with a piece of shit like that? Should we kill him? Should we beat him up? Anyone who says something like that is a dog and should be left in the streets. Francis allegedly te- was terrified, shaking in his boots, and he just shook his head yes and left. So are we really supposed to believe that Francis beat him out of some beef at a flea market? No, they're lies. So there you have it. Proof he lies, proof he was never an actual boss, and proof he was a fucking rat a paid informant for the FBI. 
Now, you can choose to keep believing all of his lies, but we have just proven what Michael Francis really is.